Welcome to Games Now lecture series. This is the fourth lecture for the autumn 2017. And we have once again a very interesting topic um, on games. Games marketing and influencers use for marketing pur purposes. My name is Anna Kaisa Kultima and today's lecture is run by Vera Rovinen from Traplight Games. And without further ado, um, Vera, with the experience of a couple of years of following the, the scene of the streamers and the use of the marketing and also Traplight's games, please take the stage. All right. I will. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I will have to do this before we can start. That looks promising. Why not? Come on. Yes? No? We shouldn't have ever <laughs> uh, just wait. taken it away. Here it goes. Yes. All right. Good, good. So yeah, welcome and thank you, Anna Kaisa, for, for asking me here. So yeah, my name is Vera Rovinen and I work as a community and marketing manager at Traplight. Uh, we are based in Tampere and we make user-generated content free-to-play mobile games. Uh, so please uh, uh, listen to my advices and the lecture from this point of view. Uh, we, so the, yeah, we are a mobile game company and we make free-to-play games. So most of my experience and my tips come from that point of view. But uh, these should be all, uh, most of these things that I'm going to tell you are applicable to uh, all kinds of influencers and all kinds of games. So, yeah, let's start. So, why do influencers matter for your game and how to work with them? That's the topic I'm going to talk about today. Uh, first of all, just to get us all kind of acclimated uh, <laughs> about the whole topic, uh, let's ask ourselves who are influencers. So, influencers, uh, as most of you know, are, uh, uh, especially nowadays, when you say the word influencer, you, uh, we mean these people who become famous on internet social platforms. So they can be YouTubers, Twitch streamers, Instagram uh, personalities, you know, Snapchat stars, they can have a profile in Musical.ly and have millions of followers, but basically they uh, are this kind of new generation of entertainers. Uh, you can also reference to like politicians and traditional musicians and these kind of people as influencers as well. But uh, for the for this lecture, uh, influencer means this type of uh, people. And what do they have in common? Well, basically, they all have a platform that they create content to. So usually a social media platform uh, or similar like YouTube or, or um, Facebook or Instagram or whatever. And they have a channel there, some sort of channel where they, or multiple channels where they create content. Uh, they also have a topic usually, like a broad topic that they create the content about. It can be about humor or music or games or, or fashion, but they usually have some sort of topic that their fans gather around. Uh, they create content, of course, and they have an audience and most importantly, they have influence over that audience. So that's the, that's the word that we're kind of <laughs> thinking today, influence and influencers. So what about games? Um, YouTube and Twitch are the most important platforms for game influencers and games, uh, game developers as well nowadays. You, of course, there's other platforms that are also very important. Uh, new platforms that are up and rising, uh, but these two have been the, the biggest ones so far. And uh, just so you know, I have been working mostly with YouTube and YouTubers uh, because Twitch is not so big on mobile games. So also most of almost of this lecture will be talking about YouTube point of view, but things also apply to the Twitch side if you are making more uh, premium games like uh, PC or or uh, console games, which are more um, kind of popular on Twitch. Uh, 
yep, other other social media platforms where influencers also thrive are not so game oriented. Uh, of course, you have some game influence influencer um, stuff on these other channels as well, but it's not so so much game oriented, especially not for uh, mid core or hardcore gaming. But it's good to note that these kind of social platforms uh, like Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat or even Musical.ly, they are actually better for super casual games because these games, their core audience is not you know, gamers, hardcore gamers or even mid-core gamers. I would say that, for example, um, Candy Crush or, or these kind of one button clicker games on mobile, they are more this super casual genre that actually don't thrive so well uh, for influencer marketing in YouTube or Twitch because their audience is not gamers, they are like general population. Um, so yeah, it's good to note that, for example, Instagram, you can see that the, uh, uh, the biggest following amounts per influencer are actually in these not gaming categories at all. So modeling, fitness, pets, beauty, design, fashion. Uh, these are the kind of, if you're making games for, for this type of audience, you might actually want to skip YouTube and Twitch altogether and focus on uh, influencers on these other platforms that reach the audience that you're trying to reach. Um, and well, example from our game, we actually tried an influencer campaign in Musical.ly and we found out that it's not a platform to um, market uh, semi-hardcore racing game, <laughs> which is very skill-based. Uh, we got uh, pretty good results, but still you could tell that the audience in that platform is more oriented towards like these super casual games. All right, so gaming YouTubers. Uh, as said, I'm gonna be talking mostly about YouTubers, but you can apply many of these things also to Twitchers or, or other influencers. But YouTube is the main platform that we're using in our marketing, and that's what we're focusing on, so uh, that's what I have most experience about. So YouTubers, they are quite young bunch. You Probably most of you follow some YouTubers or, or have watched YouTube influencer videos at some point. But in general, YouTubers are pretty young. Like the platform itself is not so old. So uh, even if you started when the platform started, you're probably like maximum 40 now. So having a 40-year-old uh, influencer, YouTube influencer, is actually quite rare. Most of them are in their 20s or 30s. And good to notice also that most of the gaming influencers on YouTube are men. So it's not very female heavy, this category. There are other categories like these fashion and entertainment and stuff where, where there's more uh, girls and women making videos. But for, for the gaming section, it's very male oriented at the moment. And also, gaming is the most male-oriented category in whole of YouTube. So it, it, this puts you to perspective. So if you're making games solely for, for girls or women, uh, you might want to you know, look at how the scene is developing in YouTube, but also put a lot of focus on other, other platforms as well. Um, but it's good to know that you know, YouTube has 50-50 uh, uh, male to female user base, so I don't see any reason why this wouldn't be shifting in the future as also uh, women are kind of more bravely starting to play uh, these mid-core and hardcore games. So I think this is gonna change. Um, about gaming channels and videos, I think most of you have watched you know, YouTube gaming videos and have browsed through these channels, but just for, for the sake of it, I'm gonna show you just an example channel and uh, explain a bit what is going on there. So um, here's a very typical gaming YouTuber channel. Um, they have lots of different games that they play, but usually they still have like some type of category, even if they play multiple games, they have some like restrictions because of their audience uh, tastes that they, they create content of. So it, when, you're, when you're doing research on YouTubers or, or just wanting to see what kind of games uh, some YouTuber plays, just go to the playlists, you know, check out what kind of what games have they played before, you can tell from, from Jelly, for example, here that he likes playing physics-based craziness, something that is just, uh, you know, emergent, crazy, physics-based, funny things happening all the time. 
and that's probably what his audience is also expecting from him from the future. So I wouldn't see this guy playing like a hardcore strategy game, for example, on his channel. And just, uh, well, oh, I can't go there because of my stupid sidebar. But you would see the About section after the channels on the right, and that's where you find the YouTuber's uh, email, which is going to be important for us uh, later on. But just so you know, it's, it's there. If you never went to the About section, go there after this lecture to check out. They have their email addresses there. Um, and yeah, about the videos, how do the gaming videos look like? There are many different types of uh, YouTube gaming videos, influencer videos, but uh, you know. A lot easier oh, to get shit. an ender pearl. I just need just one more ender pearl. That's all I need. Yeah, so here's a guy playing Minecraft. I don't know many, how many of you have played Minecraft, but. Yeah, but yeah, this this guy is uh, very good. The, this video is a very good example of a let's play video. So he it has just you know playing. He has maybe some loose goal to uh, do uh, during the video during the gameplay. Um, there's usually uh, loads of let's play videos uh, from one game for for one influencer. They usually show their face because. Uh, the fans are not only there for the for the videos; they are also there for the personality of the of the YouTuber, and they want to see their reactions to stuff. So this is this is one type of video, very common. And there are also um, where is my mouse? There. There are also many other types of 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 these uh, YouTube videos that you can have. You can have reviews, which are more uh, from these kind of journalist type of influencers. I wouldn't even maybe categorize the review videos into the same category as the other type of influencer videos. Uh, you can have these playthrough videos, series of playthrough. Um, but the Let's Play is most common. Uh, of these all. Just, you know, play the game, have fun, show something cool about the game. Uh, and of course, tutorials and stuff, so learn to play type of, type of videos. And uh, as said, you know, size and content of these channels, these gaming channels on YouTube can vary a lot, but there are many things that kind of, there are these certain boundaries within we, uh, which these influencers move. And they have lots of, lots of similarities uh, throughout. So. Let's talk about the sizes of these uh, channels or, or these influencers. Uh, these are my own terms, these macro, micro, and nano influencers. Uh, they are not universally acknowledged terms, so uh, please consider them as my own uh, terms. But they have been very useful for me uh, trying to understand what these different kind of groups of influencers actually want and need and how they work and, and stuff like that. So let's go through them. Uh, these macro influencers, so big influencers, uh, easy, easier word for that. Uh, they, in my books, I consider people with over 200,000 subscribers on YouTube. They are big. Usually, when you reach this type of threshold, you start doing it as a job. So they actually are uh, professionals. They have an established channel and they you know, do it for a living. They usually don't have any more any other jobs. They might go to school, but running a channel with over 200,000 subscribers and going to school or other work is going to be hard. So they usually just drop and focus on the, on the channel at that point. Um, they also, when you work with these bigger influencers, they can make a big impact with just one video. It's given because they have so much views, they have so much subscribers. And also, they at that point, they start focusing on paid campaigns. So they expect to get paid for if they, if they play a game on their channel, they either do it just because they love the game and they have never even been contacted by the developers, uh, or they ask money to play games if a de developer contacts them. So that's kind of the threshold after which they start you know, doing it as, as a living. Of course, they get paid through the advertisements on YouTube as well, but this is another revenue stream for them, and they most of them uh, focus on the paid paid campaigns. Uh, then the micro-influencers, they're the kind of ne next, uh, next group after the big ones. Uh, my own, in my own books, I consider these five to 50,000 subscriber 
uh, channels to be in this micro category. But you know, with 50,000 subscri subscribers, you can also actually live with the channel. It depends so much on what other things you're doing, uh, which country you're in, and all that. So these are very vague, but to give you some ballpark. Um, these guys are actually, they have more uh, influence over their audience uh, than the bigger influencers because they have more engaged fans and they see their, you know, these smaller influencers are seen as more authentic. So their fans actually, you know, are more, more engaged and they come back to watch the videos time after time. Whereas the bigger influencers might have subscribers that actually never go watch their videos or do it very ra rarely. And these guys, they're still growing, they're learning how to be a YouTuber. They probably don't live off the trade at, uh, at this point, so uh, they might be doing non-paid campaigns. So if they're approached by a developer, they might be interested to try something, even if uh, you cannot afford to pay them, or just you know if you can offer them something fun instead. And then there's this group that I have uh, figured out myself. <laughs> I don't know if people reference to these small, really, really small influencers uh, any, in any other way than being like brand ambassadors or something, something similar to that, or like social whales could be another word. But basically they are people that have less than 1,000 subscribers. They might have a small channel as like 50 subscribers, but they're they're actually very, they, they are this bunch that if you can harness their power, uh, you know, you can get lots done. But it's very hard to reach them, like, they are sc scattered all around, and, uh, yeah, but, but they are very engaged. They're more players than, than actual influencers, but they are also, like, very eager to share stuff out of the game, and they want to make content, even though they don't, they don't yet have, like, a huge following. So, now you know who they are about. Um, so why should you care about them? What do they do for you if you're a developer? And um, what could, good can they do for you? So first of all, talking about YouTube, uh, your audiences, if you're making games, your audiences match. So YouTubers are probably the people that you actually want to reach with your games, regardless of what kind of game you're making unless it's like one of those super, super, super casuals. And even then, I think you can, you can reach the right audience there. Uh, basically, there are over 1 billion monthly YouTube users. And from those, 60% go into the category, which you would probably consider to be a good target audience for games these days. So 18 to 44 is like the gamer um, generation. They, they are the ones who uh, play games, and they're the ones who pay for games. So there's a lot of those people already in YouTube. And also YouTube, uh, well, gaming is YouTube's biggest category. So 30% of all views in YouTube come from gaming videos. So every, almost every third view or every third video that is watched is a gaming video. So that's a good thing to keep in mind. And you know, the next biggest category is entertainment. They only have 19% of the views. And you don't see YouTube making YouTube entertainment, like its own app and website, but they do have YouTube gaming, so that tells that they're actually uh, also, they know that it's big. And of course, there's a big group of these under 18 people. Uh, we all know that they're, the kids these days, they are, well, at least I know, I have noticed it, that kids these days are super, super crazy about YouTube videos, especially gaming videos. And uh, they are there, but you don't have statistics of that, of course, because you have to be 18 to use YouTube. But, you know, everyone knows they're there. They also, they meaning the influencers, they also bring results. So uh, this is studied and noted that people install games more likely through an influencer video than um, through traditional marketing. So compared, if, if you put an advertisement in YouTube, uh, before a video or an interstitial video, uh, you're not going to get as much clicks, uh, installs to your game, uh, etc. Then, if uh, if that game is actually played on an influencer video, then it brings better results. The players who come through influencer videos on YouTube have better engagement, retention, and monetization. This means that they play the game more often. They come back 
to play the game more often, or, or they play more of the game, they come back more often, and they also use more money. And the monetization part is, of course, most related to free-to-play games, uh, which I'm working with, uh, in, in premium games, if you don't have any DLCs or, or these, for example, loot boxes or anything to purchase, then your monetization per user is just the purchase of the game and then it's always the same. But for free-to-play games, these people who come through influencer videos are like better quality players all around. And it's also easy to target the right audience through the influencer because you usually, you can see their audience already. You can see who are watching these videos and you can also ask them like, who is your audience? And it's very, it's quite easy to match your game audience and the audience of the influencer. And the one of the cool results that can happen through these influencer videos is this trickle down. This is again my own term, but I think it, uh, depicts it very nicely. So when a big influencer makes a video of your game, usually smaller influencers pick up the game organically just by seeing the big influencer play the game. So by making having one big big video in YouTube of your game, you might actually get like bonus uh, 10 videos just because uh, as a result of that. Of, of course, from smaller channels, but anyway. Um, here's some example, uh, or a couple of examples from our game. We have one game out called Big Bang Racing. It's a user-generated content mobile racing game where players create tracks and they share them uh, with the community and all the, all the levels in the game are made by the players. Um, we did a campaign with a YouTuber that had 2.6 million subscribers and uh, Basically, what we saw, the, don't be scared of the numbers, I will explain them. There are many uh, weird things that you might not understand right away, but I will explain. So, um, these players who came through the YouTuber video had 14 percentage points higher D1 retention. So, this means that they were 14% more likely to open the game one day after installing it then compared to people who just uh, organically found the game in the App Store in Google or in Google Play. And then they also had seven percentage points higher D7 retention, which means one week after downloading the game, they were 7% more, uh, more likely to come back to the game than those who you know, downloaded the, or found the game on their own uh, in the App Store. They also used uh, three times as much money uh, in the game as compared to these organic users who just find the game somewhere. So the players who came through this influencer video were like very, very much better quality for us as developers. They, they played more and they used more money and they probably were also happier with the game because they kept coming back. So, And also we saw this trickle down effect. So five nano or micro influencers picked up the game uh, and those videos totaled to 6,000 views. It's not too much uh, for this campaign, but for another campaign, we had uh, we saw uh, three micro influencers pick up the game, and their videos totaled to 41,000 views. So those were just views that we didn't expect, we were not paying for, we had not planned, we didn't set up any campaign with them, but they just picked up the game organically and played the game, and that caused us uh, pretty nice bunch of extra views that we were not expecting and probably some downloads, but of course we don't have any like exact numbers. We have guesses, but we cannot say anything uh, for sure from that. So, why is it happening? Why do we get such good results? <laughs> um, the viewers trust YouTubers. Uh, yeah, that's, that's plain and simple. They trust them. Um, they are seen, uh, YouTubers are seen more honest than traditional marketing. Uh, even if they are getting paid to do a video of a game and they plainly say that this is a paid promotion, they are still considered to be not the developer. They are not the person who is trying to market something to you. Uh, so yeah, if a, if a developer makes an ad, it's always like it comes from top down somewhere from this faceless brand or this faceless developer. developer. But when a person is, you know, saying that I like this game, that's that's gonna um, affect more and they are considered honest. And also I think it's because many of the YouTubers are trying to 
uh, trying not to play games that they don't like. So they can be honest. They, they don't want to lose the respect and trust of their audience. So even if they're getting paid, they don't want to make campaigns where they just plainly hate the game because their viewers are, are going to see that. So they try to keep this trust and to be trustworthy and honest with their, with their fans. And they're also seen as normal people, uh, kind of like you and me, but uh, the smaller the channel, the more they are seen as normal people because they are still, you know, they're probably doing the videos from their own room in their parents' house still, or, or they're not like living like kings. There are some YouTubers, of course, that are so, you know, so high up that they probably live like a superstar life by now. But most of the YouTubers that you're going to work with ever are going to, are normal people. They're just doing their job, so you know they're not seen as advertisers or, or these weird weird people. Um, and also people think that, you know, I like this person. They watch the videos because of someone's personality as much as the as the content, if not if not more. So the personality of the YouTuber is very important for the fans and they like that person, so why wouldn't I like the stuff that they like? So that's kind of the thing that is going through their head. And also good to note is that YouTubers have their own ecosystem as well. As I said, the trickle down effect is only possible because the U influencers have influence over each other as well. So the big influencers were probably there when the smaller ones were starting. They were starting their channel and they were looking up to these other guys that made cool content and they started uh, copying them or taking, taking notes from that. And when they have big channels, they're still going to look up to those guys that helped them or uh, gave them inspiration. So it's, it's a whole ecosystem of influence inside YouTube. All right. Well, now you know who they are. And now you know also why you should care about them. So now the hardest part, how to work with them, how to actually make something happen with them, how to make campaigns, how to approach them, and so forth. So. Where to start? Um, this is pretty simple. So you need to know your game before you can start anything with influencers. Um, you need to be able to list down the biggest competitors, the, the strengths and, and weaknesses of your game, what makes it unique, uh, is it, is it YouTubeable or streamable even? Does it have fun things to show or watch? All of these questions are very important before you even start thinking about working with an influencer. So you need to make a very thorough kind of market analysis, competitor anal analysis of your game, and um, think about these questions. And then, well, the next step broadly is to, of course, search for these channels that could work for you uh, that, or could be a good match for your game. You can do that by just you know going to Google, start Googling, uh, go, to, go to YouTube, start searching for there, or use some other tools. Uh, but basically, the, the analysis that you did before of your game uh, should help you w with you know, narrowing down who you should work with or who could be a good match. And <clears throat> before you even start this, uh, the whole process, um, you need to also note, note to yourself that it's not only about the influencer's preferences. It's mostly about their audiences. So the influencer themselves or the YouTuber might actually love your game, but they're not never going to play it on their channel. That's a that's a real possibility because many many of them have started. You know, they played many games. They maybe tested one game and then suddenly ev all of their fans loved that game and they just kept playing it. And that's how you know Minecraft channels starts or or. Uh, Clash Royale's uh, channel starts, your, your fans just want to see more of that game. And if they have that one game or a couple of games or a game genre that their fans love, uh, they're probably not going to uh, try to risk it by playing some game that they might love, but their audience would not. So I've heard this, this many times that some influencers say that, yeah, I actually love horror games, but I have no chance of playing those on the channel, so I play them on my free time. Or they maybe start a second channel later to play those games that they, they want to play as well. And for, for tools to search for influencers, to look at different kind of channels to find them, you can use also not just the YouTube search, but you can use, for example, Vidstats, X, or uh, this new one, Channel Crawler, is very nice. 
or their social blade, all these kind of tools that are going to help you to list influencers. So what to look for when you're uh, making your list or, or uh, searching for influencers? What are important things to keep in mind? You want to look for channels that have high engagement. This means that uh, the views to subscribers ratio is high. Um, so you might have a channel that has 2 million subscribers, but there's only you know, 10,000 views per video. That's quite poor uh, ratio. But you might have a channel with uh, 10,000 sub subscriber subscribers that have 9,000 views per video. That means that 90% of the, of the subscribers actually come to watch those videos, or roughly. So you can tell that this, this person, even though they have a lot smaller channel, they have more engagement on their channel, their fans are super, you know, they are really, really fans, they want to come back and they're waiting for the new videos. Um, you also want to look at comments on the video, so uh, just to see if anyone's commenting, if there anyone's liking the videos or disliking, just to see kind of what the general mood there is, because there are many channels where the channel is actually dying, but you don't see it just by looking at the subscriber count. Many of the subscribers might have just forgotten about this person and never coming back. And so you need to keep that in mind. Uh, also, it's very important to when you're when you're looking at these channels because uh, I will uh, expect that you have a new game that you want to market. So you want to check out the channel if they have ever introduced a new game to the channel and how did it go. So scroll down, you know, see what they have played. If you find a game that is obviously new, it had never been played on the channel before, see how it went. Like, go check out the comments, the likes. Did they ever play that game again? Did the audience react like, oh my god, what is this game? Please play more. Or were they like, oh, go back to playing Minecraft, this sucks. So, you know, that, that's going to tell you a lot about how their audience perceives new games on the channel. You want to know that before introducing a new game to a channel. So yeah, there's uh, some comments from uh, our game or, or a video that an influencer made on their channel and uh, uh, there was very good reaction. So, hey, what is this game? This game looks cool and, and stuff like that. So that was a very positive stuff for us. Also, you have to keep in mind before doing any plans is what can you afford? So compare the big influencers and the, and the smaller ones. Uh, note that even the, even the small ones might want to get paid or compensated. It depends uh, very much on the influencer themselves and what they're used to. But you should at least have some sort of idea on what can you afford or can you afford, you know, uh, do you want to work in other ways than money? Because that's also possible. And as said in the, the first part, the big channel doesn't automatically mean that it's a good channel. Uh, it can be a, a dying channel, or it can be just a wrong fit for your game. So, so don't automatically think that, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push this to PewDiePie because he has the biggest channel, so what could go wrong? <laughs> Many things can go wrong. So um, you really need to understand who you're trying to uh, put your game, or where, which channels you're gonna, you want to put your game into. And then keep a list. This is a screenshot of my list. Uh, my Excel, it, it's actually a lot wider. There's lots of more columns, but I had to, uh, you know, put it a little uh, smaller. But basically, this is some, like, just a small part of uh, my list that I have been collecting based on just researching channels and, and finding some interesting channel that maybe we could one day work with. Uh, these are definitely not channels that we, like, we have worked with all of these channels, but it's more like a list for me to understand what is our what is our game and what kind of influencers would be like a good match. So you can see here uh, there's the nickname of the person, YouTube link, category, language, genres. Uh, platform is very important. If you're making a mobile game, you probably don't want to approach a person that only plays PC games. Be well, they might be you know, interested to add a mobile game to their, their channel, but it's more likely that they, they are not. Of course you can ask, but it's good to still note, at least when you're approaching them, that you understand if they have already played the games on your platform. Especially on consoles, that's going to be hard. If they don't own the console, they're probably not going to buy it unless you, you know, send them, send them the console to try your game out. And 
as you can see here, I have put the subscribers, but also the average views. Uh, uh, it's it should say last uh, three months or last month. So just to understand what the trend is on the channel, so you can compare the subscribers and the average view counts on the video. So you know that if it's a it's a channel that is actually uh, growing, and you can see probably that if you look at a channel that has high subscriber, and then you go down the list and you find another channel that has small amount of subscribers, but they actually have more um, average views per month. So you probably might want to work with that one instead. And of course, the email address, you need to be able to contact them somehow. So uh, there's many ways to approach YouTubers. Uh, the list that I just showed is uh, kind of connected to the first option. Uh, so that's the the do-it-yourself option. So you can you can send you can approach these people. You can send them emails. You can send them direct messages in in Twitter, or you can even meet them face to face. So you can actually set up some stuff. You can get to get to know them uh, just by doing it yourself. It's it's not impossible. So um, it's always good to try talk with other community managers or influencer managers from other game companies. Uh, go to events where you can meet other, other developers and ask who they work with and maybe if they can recommend someone, maybe they can introduce you to someone. So you might get your first contacts through other, other developers. And usually developers are very open to sharing these in, in, this information because uh, it's not good for them or the influencer to try to keep their business like very secretive and and like not sharing contacts because it's a it's kind of this trust relationship so the influencer trusts that the developer is going to send new customers to their way like new potential developers who would be interested to work with them and then they will also you know be happy with the developer you know they might want to work with them again so it's, it's good for both that you actually share. Um, when you're contacting them, whether it's email or face-to-face -face or whatever, be really brief and explicit in what you want. Um, they, they don't have much time. I've learned this the hard way. They don't have time to read long emails. Even if you have the best game, they're not going to read multiple sentences on explaining what your game is about. And, and stuff like that. So you really have to, you know, chew it all up and put it in a nice package that they they can understand immediately. And then, if they get interested, then it's you know easier to talk. It's kind of like marketing. You have to market your your thing for them. And always remember to add uh, this uh, call to action. What do you actually want them to do? Do you want them to contact you again, or do you already want to set up a campaign, or what is it that you want to do? And if they answer you back, if you get hold of them on, uh, in, a, in an event and you exchange contacts or they answer your email, whatever, be prepared to be for them uh, kind of 24 seven. They can be on weird time zones and, and they are usually awake at weird, weird times as well, even if they're on your time zone. So they, they will probably need help. They have lots of questions, whatever. So it's, it's just good practice to be able to communicate them through some sort of personal messaging, whether it's WhatsApp or, or Skype. Some of them use still Skype and, or, or Discord, whatever. So just be prepared for that. So here's a really, really brief explanation how to make a good approach email. This, this feels a bit silly to, to show you, but maybe this helps someone, so, so I don't know. Um, you want to have a title, of course, for your email, but that should already include what you're offering. What do you want to say? What do you want them to do? Like, as, as compact as possible. So, for example, we sent emails, um, you know, something like, come to, or, or join a pre-launch party in Finland. You know, that's, that's a, already the call to action, like, come, come to Finland to a party. And they're like, oh, what is this email? I want to see. They get, I've heard this so many times from them, they get so much emails that if the, if the title is not already like something that they want to read, then they're just going to trash it. So, <laughs> so you have to already sell it there. Then, you know, what is your thing? What is your game? If you have a game, usually uh, just, you know, describe it with one sentence already in the beginning. Uh, 
we've noticed that it's good to always compare to other popular titles. <laughs> uh, so, for example, you check out what games they have already played. If you did your research well, you know that they played this game that is a competitor and this other game that is also competitor in another way. And our game is kind of like a cross between those two games. So you're going to say it there, definitely, because they get interested, of course, more interested than if you just explained the hard way uh, the mechanics and whatever of the game. So it has to be like, yes, I already see what this game about, uh, what this game is about, just by reading this this one comparison. And uh, you know, it's always good to explain for them why you think that this game would be good for their channel and for their fans. So you already show in the beginning of the email or the contact message that you have actually thought thought this out. You're just not approaching a random influencer, but you you really think that this is a good thing for both of you. And always add a trailer. They probably probably even skip the sentence that you put, but the trailer is there, so they're going to watch the video. Um, then have the proposal. What do you want them to do? Uh, very briefly, what is the? This is the call to action part. And then uh, kind of explain again what is that you offer them, not just like hey, hey we want you to do a video. Uh, they also want to hear what is that you can offer them and their channel and their fans. And yeah, well, call to action again, kind of uh, just you know remember to tell them to contact you <laughs> and and put all the all the possible contact channels there so they can choose if they want to send you a WhatsApp message or or Skype or whichever. And remember that even if you make the most perfect uh, contact email or or message or you approach them, you have planned everything. It's probably going to fail. So prepare yourself for that. But it's not going to fail every time. That's the good good thing. So if you do it enough, you're going to get uh, interested people, and you're going to get contacts, and you can start talking with them about the actual thing that you want to do. So what is the other option? That is through uh, agents, agencies, or multi-channel networks, or an influencer platform. These are. Uh, kind of tools that you can use, and they are very, very common. Uh, most, most developers use these, especially when you start have starting, when you're starting to have uh, bigger budgets for your influencer marketing. These are kind of the how to, how to do it, mainly. Um, the multi-channel networks, they, they work so that you have like an agency and then the influencers join the agency, they pay them uh, like a monthly fee or a percentage of their revenue and they get uh, basically all the benefits of having agents delivering them new customers and, and just sorting their everyday life out like when they have to fly to an event somewhere, uh, the agency takes care of all the, all the stuff for that. Um, the good thing about the, working with these multi-channel networks is that they, they will deliver because they have uh, contracts there also inside the agency. So if you make a contract with the agency, then the influencer actually has to deliver. Whereas if you do like face, uh, like one-on-one -on -one, uh, deals, you never know what's going to happen. Of course, those are usually very reliable as well, but these guys will at least for sure deliver. And it's very easy or easier to reach big names through the, the multi-channel networks because most of them are already in a multi-channel network. Um, they, they usually, when they become big, they usually join a network because it just becomes more easy for them. Uh, uh, some negative sides fro from that is that they cost more. Uh, the a lot part is probably not the truest uh, to say it like that, but they cost more than than some other types of campaigns because they also, you know, there's the portion that goes to the agents, and also there can be a lot of has hassle because you're not talking to the influencer uh, straight, but there's always an agent between you. So you say something, and the agent says it forward usually, and then there can be this broken phone situation that just keeps going on. So there's that. And there's also platforms. Uh, some good examples, uh, for example, the great matchmade guys uh, from Helsinki. I don't know if you know those, but you know you can contact Jiri Kupiainen if you want to ask about uh, this side of influencer marketing. So uh, these type of platforms that have kind of automated the system. So instead of having agents in between, there's the platform. So 
um, developer sets up a campaign idea on the platform like, hey, we want three this sized uh, YouTubers to make a let's play video of our game, which is this. And these are the things that would be very cool for the influencer to show. And this is how much we're going to pay per user that downloads the game through this campaign. And then the influencers can, on the other end, browse the campaign ideas and be like, hey, this is a cool, cool game or a great match for my channel. So I'm going to pick or, or I'm, I'm OK with the price that they're paying. So I'm going to pick this campaign up. And they are usually very easy to set up the campaigns and, and they d deliver very fast and they can be very cost efficient because there's this, you know, you can find, inf find influencers that are able to do at lower cost uh, also, maybe easier than through the agencies. But the bad or the negative side is that you don't get to know these influencers personally. You are always working through the platform and the contacts stay at the platform. So you don't get usually any personal contacts through these. And to scale up, if you're like growing, your company's growing, your games are growing, you have revenue that you can use for marketing, it's always good to combine these two. So not just, you know, uh, do the, the first or the second. So about personal relationships, they are super important if you want to do long lasting collaboration with influencers. If you just want to make one video with some random guy and you don't care about what they do in the future or if they like you, then you know, you, you don't have to <laughs> have personal relationship. But it's, it's good to do it for, for any type of longer, longer collaboration. So for example, you can invite them for a visit, which is what we did before the launch of our game. Um, you can fly them over, you know, send an invite to a party or, or an invitation to get to know your games, uh, to get some, some other cool stuff. You know, many of them haven't visited, well, they have visited Supercell in, in Finland, but on any other place is very exotic and cool for them. Um, and these type of visits, they give you a lot of valuable feedback and understanding of what the influencers actually want, what they how they work, uh, what their fans want, and all these kind of things that would be probably impossible to, to get this information otherwise, especially if you can organize this very like relaxed atmosphere, you can actually chat with them like normal people and not feel like it's, a, it's this very stuck up work situation. And if you don't have a lot of budget, you of course need some budget because you need to fly them over. Uh, usually they're not going to pay their own flights. Sometimes they do if they're really, really interested. But usually it's good to, if you want them to come over to, you know, figure out some sort of budget for the, for the expenses. Uh, of course, you can also go to an event where you know that they're going to be and, and, you know, book a restaurant, just invite them for a dinner or something. That might also work. So you don't always have to fly them to Finland. But if you don't have much uh, budget, you can also collabor collaborate with other smaller developers. Uh, just put your money together and fly a bunch of influencers, YouTubers over and host them. You know, show them your games, have fun times. And this is actually also good for the influencers because if you are all new or relatively unknown developers, they probably want to meet many of you guys. They want to meet and see what you're doing uh, instead of just you know, seeing one one developer. So it's, it's always possible to do it as a collaboration. And there are some pictures from the party that we had uh, or the influencer event that we had before the launch of our game. And we invited them over. We flew them over and hosted them for three days. We had first day just dinner, very informal. The second day we showed them the game. We talked about the game a lot because that was uh, over a month before the launch and we got super, super good feedback. I mean, not good as in this game is amazing, that was also there, but uh, we got really good feedback so that they, they told us what they actually want to see in the game. They told us features, they told us about uh, what their fans would love to see, and we took all this feedback and we actually implemented those things in the, in the game. And without this feedback and without listening to them, the game wouldn't have been as YouTubeable or as fun to watch as it, as it is now. So that was a very, very good experience. All right, onwards. Uh, what do they then need? Like, you know, you now know how to kind of like contact them, how to work with them, but what do they actually want and need? That's a good question. First of all, it's not just about money. Many people like have this idea in their head that, yeah, we just take a big 
bunch of money and we give it to an influencer and they're going to make a video. That works as well. That works many times. So just give them the money and they make the video. No problem there. But uh, what they also think, not just about money, is their audience. So as told before, their audience might have very um, set tastes or they have certain things that they hate, certain things that they love. And, and they are also, they are entertainers. They are not game journalists per se, even if they might make content that seems a bit like that. But usually if they are like these kind of uh, YouTubers that I'm referring to, they um, they don't make this kind of <laughs> this kind of content. But they they really want to entertain their audience and want to make sure that they they love what they're seeing on the channel. Um, and because of this, they look for games that can help them, you know, give fun stuff for their audience. There there is a reason why some games are just so popular on YouTube. There is a good reason for that because they're so fun to watch and the audiences love them. So that's why they are played there. Um, and they are kind of constantly on the lookout for new fun games to show because they also want to kind of stand out uh, from the other channels. They want to find something new and exciting. So, so they're on the lookout. And what they're also kind of looking from you as a developer is not just the money, but they also, and not just a fun game, but in, uh, also on top of that, something exclusive, something special that maybe the other influencers don't have, or something that they can give to their fans, or just something cool and exclusive. And, you know, this is was already earlier, but if you <coughs> collaborate with them, what they also need uh, on the top of, or instead of money is, um, for you to be there for them and to answer all their questions. And it can get very tedious sometimes to just you know, keep saying, uh, saying the same things and, and telling them how the game works and all these things. But it's very necessary because they do so many, they play so many games that you just have to be there for them to explain. And, well, this is something that you should consider. Uh, instead of just you know making a game, then paying an influencer to make a video, you should uh, already, when you're designing your game, think about them, make your games for them. So you can either develop your games with influencers, uh, get their input on the game before it's uh, completely fixed, or uh, at least develop your games keeping influencers in mind. Oh, and. Uh, when you're designing games, it, you, you, of course, you design games for someone. So uh, for, for not just thinking about you know, who's going to play this game, who's going to be the main player audience, you might also want to include influencers as one target group. So think about what would an influencer do with this game when you're already designing it? What would be fun things for them to show on their channel? What can they, how can they uh, interact or collaborate with their fans around the game? and all these kind of things. So you can already start doing this uh, in the design phase if you want to think influencers like ahead of time. And you can, as, as we did, you can invite them over uh, in early stages. That was the game, when we invited them over, the game was pretty fixed already. So we were able to add a couple of features uh, in a time span of uh, one month before the launch. But you can, I'd say just, like bravely invite them over even earlier when it's like in beta or even before soft launch, just to kind of get their input and you can still make pretty big changes at that point if you get really, really interesting ideas from them. And listen to them. So uh, you, might, you might hear feedback at some point that if you show your game to an influencer, they might say very bluntly, like, this is not gonna work on YouTube. Like, this is n never gonna work on YouTube. And you have to get rid of this and this and that and add this and this and that. And you're going to feel, of course, that's going to feel like, oh, why did you say that? I don't want to hear that. Because you put your heart and soul in the game, of course. But they, they really know what they're talking about when talking about what is fun to watch and what audiences would like to see. So listening to their feedback is very good. Of course, it doesn't mean that you have to take, if they say a feature, just take that feature like that and impl implement it in the game. But you know, try to understand what is the reason behind that they said this feature. And then dig out there and then design another feature that actually suits the, better, uh, the game better and works better, but has the same kind of idea behind it. And you know, create the features that they might need as well. So not just things that, you know, 
why is something fun to watch or, or something, but they might also have like very specific things that would make YouTubing about the game easier for them. So these are good things to keep in mind. And they are definitely um, experts of virality and they understand their audiences. So if you want to reach their audience, you should probably listen to them. And uh, here's a couple of examples on uh, how, how developers have designed games for influencers or with influencers. So I'm going to show you, um, first of all, I'm going to show you about the Immortal Redneck by a Spanish developer called Crema. And they have, the, yeah, the game called Immortal Redneck is um, it's a PC game, a Steam game, a first person shooter. And what they did was, uh, well, the game has this system that when you play, you randomly get these uh, chests that pop you up, uh, pop up some scrolls for you. And these scrolls are these um, power-ups or whatever that you can use to uh, enhance your game experience. And that's a mechanic in the game. But what they did for streamers, for Twitch streamers especially, is that they added a Twitch plugin. So instead of, uh, if you played the Twitcher mode of this game, instead of getting the loot boxes or the chests inside the game, uh, you have a vote going on all the time. You have three scrolls on the top of your screen and the viewers can vote which scroll you're gonna get next. So that's your random system. But the, the, player, the viewers can affect on what's gonna happen for you. And here's an example from one, uh, let me check just a second. Here's an example from, from one Twitcher uh, who played the game and how, how it worked out for for them. Man, y'all are so gold, chat. So the street, uh, the so scrolls are on the on the upper right corner, as you can see. No matter how many chances I give you, chat, you always just keep giving me what I want. God, you're so easy to, 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 to see. And you probably won't be able to change your vote because you're going to hear this 30 seconds too late. And now you can look at the votes <laughs> on the on the upper right. Wait, no, fuck! I won! <laughs> Jack, no! My goals! Jack! So, yeah, that's what you get. Jack! So yeah, the, the chat voted instead of him getting like a cool power up, he got this, you lose half of your gold. And uh, that just makes it uh, like a really great feature for, for the developer uh, to use in their game. Like, like they, they, this feature was added just keeping Twitchers in mind. And what happened the, uh, after they released the game, uh, or actually it was uh, only in, in early access, I think, many Twitchers just picked up the game uh, organically without asking because they heard about this really fun feature that would add amazing content for their channel and something that how they can interact with their fans and their fans can interact their gameplay. So it worked very well for them and it, I think it was a, it's a very good spot on example of how to design uh, games by keeping influencers in mind. Um, then the other, other game is, well, I'm not going to go back to the slides. I'm just going to show the video. So the other game is called Fast Lane by uh, Space Ape from London. And they have a mobile, uh, they're a mobile game studio. And they created this, this game where um, all the playable characters in the game are YouTubers. So from the get go, like they kept the, the YouTubers, the YouTubers are inside the game. So this is a guy called Quebblecop. Maybe some of you have watched his videos. But he's one of the playable characters in the game. And uh, in this video, he, exp he explains a bit about the situation. I have a very special announcement. I am in a video game. And it's not just a small video game. It's a pretty big video game, a pretty badass video game. Teaming up with Space Age Games, and I will be in Fastlane Cup. So you guys are going to be seeing loads of cool things happening in the future. And, uh, and actually, starting off today, Fastlane is out. You guys should totally go and check it out. I'm going to leave a link in the description. And I'm actually about to play. 
Car. Oh, yes. Right over here, you can see. And here you can see uh, some of the, well, the playable characters that he's showing off. All your favorite YouTubers, obviously my favorite one is Quobblecop. Not Jelly, not Slogoman, no, 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 not Addy, no, no, it's Quobblecop, this guy, you see. Oh, even more rewards. So yeah, um, not, not showing you uh, more, you, you get the idea from that. But basically they designed the whole game so that influencers are the playable characters. There's no uh, like, you know, faceless random game characters, but they're all uh, there as uh, these influencer characters. And they, they had a campaign or campaigns where, uh, where the, um, where the YouTubers were showing off the game, of course, and playing as their own character and challenging other, uh, other YouTubers, etc. So, you can have some of these features that are kind of good to keep in mind for for all games that make make uh, the game more YouTube YouTubeable or streamable and are kind of like non-game specific, but then you can have very, very specific features like that uh, one from Immortal Redneck or even this fast lane approach is very, very unique. So there are many ways to do this. So what we have done, uh, some examples from our game, our first game, Big Bang Racing. Uh, so we invited the, the bigger influencers over and we asked their feedback and uh, we did some features based on that. So one thing that we heard from them, that this was their idea. They told us, why don't you, you have these levels made by the player, so every level that I play is made by another player and you know there's the, at the end of the level and before the level there's their profile, you can see the face of the person who created it, you can follow that person inside the game and you know you can see all this info about, info about that person, but what if there was also their YouTube channel link? And we were like, oh my god, why didn't we think of that ourselves? Yes, of course we're gonna put their YouTube channel links there. So anyone uh, in our game is able to um, add their own YouTube channel to their profile, and it's, it is shown to everyone who plays their levels. So we have you know eight million levels over eight million levels in the game, but the best ones are played millions and millions of, of times. So if you create a good level and you have your YouTube link there, player, players are gonna see it millions and millions of times. So you're gonna get clicks to your channel. So they just like gave us this amazing cross-promotional tool that we can use, especially with smaller influencers, uh, to help them grow their channels as well. So that happened. Then they got this idea of, uh, or the, this we designed together, uh, would they like to have custom hats? You, we have hats in the game, so the player characters can wear different kind of cool hats. And uh, we asked them, would you like like your own, if you can design your own hat and we just make it happen for you? And they were, of course, that's amazing. We want to do that. So we made them custom hats and they are able to gift those, those hats to their fans because if you follow that influencer inside the game, you get the hat as a gift. So that's already something cool that they can tell their fans, like if you want to wear my cat, which is always on the streams and the videos, you know, wear my cat as a hat, you know, go to the game and, and, and get it. We also, uh, later in the game, we added a uh, tournaments uh, update, so we branded those as well, uh, or we enabled uh, ourselves to be able to brand the tournaments uh, for YouTubers. So not just having like a generic tournament, we would always have a host for the tournament. Whether it's Traplight or whether it's uh, a top uh, player in our game who is hosting the tournament, or if it's a YouTuber, we were able to add uh, or brand these this tournament. So you would have the YouTube channels there, the, the icons, you can see the host in the leaderboards all the time. They are highlighted in the chat and all that. So for a YouTuber, that's already something really cool. They can tell their fans like, hey, you can see my time constantly in the leaderboards. Try to beat my time. Come chat with me in the chat. Or, or um, uh, we also added this, um, that you can get extra nitros to use in the tournament if you click uh, to the YouTubers channel. So instead of just having them, you know, promote our game, we would also drive traffic from our game to their channel. Uh, for the micro and nano influencers uh, in Big Bang Racing, we of course gave them free in-game currency, that's a given, and of course for the big influencers as well, so that they can create better content. So for, for uh, free-to-play games, this is uh, a bit specific, but uh, for, for um, 
premium games, you of course want to give the game for free for an influencer. <laughs> that's that's a given. And for the free-to-play games, you want to give them uh, free in-game currency so they can buy chests, they can maybe do chest opening videos or just buy cool things, uh, upgrades for their vehicles or buy new <coughs> editor items that they can build cool levels with. And also we gave them visibility inside the game. So uh, the links, the profile, YouTube profile links that uh, are seen there on the top picture, uh, we would give these smaller influencers if they created a cool level, for example, we would fix that level so that all the players for 24 hours would have to play that level. So we can guarantee that this many players are going to see your channel link there and uh, there's, there's like 20% of them who's gonna click to your channel. So kind of do this cross-promotional thing for them. And one thing to also notice about Big Bang Racing is that uh, the, uh, the top creators or the players who create really cool levels in our games, uh, we also consider them as a group of influencers. They are more influencers inside the game, but they also, many of them actually grow into YouTube influencers as they, as they uh, play and create. So our approach continues. Uh, this was our first uh, game, our first tests with working with influencers. Uh, we got a lot of good learnings from there. We already did many things right, which we, which we are very happy about, but there are many things that we can improve in the future. And in our upcoming games, we're gonna focus on the same things, but kind of enhance them. So for the bigger influencers, uh, we already did this a bit with the tournaments that they can be hosts for the tournament, but to kind of make that even bigger, we want the influencers to be able to have special roles in events inside the game. So uh, they can actually tell their fans that I am in this event right now. You know, if you come there, you can try to kick my ass or you can try to beat my army or, or you know, build with me or whatever. They, uh, to build a system where we can add special roles for them inside the game is something that we want to do. Of course, we still want to keep listening to their feedback and, and create features based on that, uh, on top of the fact that we also design these and try to design them ourselves. But we're gonna definitely keep doing that with our future games, uh, upcoming games as well. We want to make the custom gifting easier for them uh, and easier for us. So the hat thing that we did in Big Bang Raising, it was a great success. Uh, the influencers loved it, their fans loved it, but it was very tedious because we were not prepared from the get-go to create these custom items for them and to give them to them as gifts and for them to be able to gift those to their fans. So it was a whole process. So we want to make this very swift and easy. So if there's something that we can customize in the game, we should be able to make that uh, into a customized thing for the YouTuber and then just give it to them and they should be able to very easily gift that to their fans. And then for the uh, micro and nano influencers, this is something that we're working on. So we want our games to automatically recognize the smaller influencer or basically any influencer, but especially for the smaller ones that are harder, harder, harder to reach and we're probably not making like paid campaigns with them. We want the game to know that they're there. We want the game to tell them like, oh my God, you're here. Here's some cool stuff that you can show to your fans or something that you can give to your fans. Because if they come to the game and they don't immediately recognize what would be cool thing, you know, uh, about this, then they might leave. So we want the game to recognize them and give them stuff uh, so that they can also gift stuff to their fans uh, very easily and without us like manually doing it all the time for them. And for the, especially for the very small channels, uh, the influencers that are starting, we want to, the game to be very easy to YouTube or uh, stream or Twitch about. Uh, there should be on a technical level uh, things that make it very easy for them. Not all of them have like very fancy uh, recording studios or whatever, so just making it as easy as possible for them to pick up the game and start streaming or, or send a video to YouTube uh, is very important. And what we're also doing uh, as part of our pre-production processes is a workshop about influencer features for each team. So we talk about, uh, we, as I said earlier, about 
considering influencers as one of your target groups. So this is exactly what we're doing. So we think of influencers as a target group. We go through what they, uh, what would be the things in this game, particularly, particularly that are very interesting to show, and what could they, you know, give give their fans and and show their fans, or how could they interact or collaborate with their fans and try to design these features that support the gameplay, but are also very fun for the influencers and their fans. And very quickly about our user-generated content influencers. Uh, we have these top creators, as I told you, these creators that have you know, lots of followers inside the game. And these guys have also grown, some of them have grown into uh, external influencers in YouTube, for example. So the Hota CDI was a, uh, or is a top creator in our game. And um, he creates amazing levels. And he has over 24, uh, 25,000 followers inside the game. So in the game system, his profile has this many followers. And all the followers get a push notification when he makes a new level, and they can come and check it out, and so on. And he has millions and millions of likes on his levels. So he started a YouTube channel, and of course we were like, oh my god, this guy makes such a good content. We want to support his channel as well. So we made a level creation competition for him. So he announced the, the competition on his channel, and we pushed it the uh, pop up in the game and told everyone that there's a cool level creation competition. He's going to be one of the judges, and there's a prize, this custom hat that he has designed for the winner. We also gave him his own racing tournament. He created the racing level. We put a tournament around that, and he was hosting it. So that was very good. Uh, good stuff for his channel as well. We also give him sneak peeks of our upcoming updates. For example, the anniversary update, he was the first uh, influencer to know about the contents of the update, and he was able to present them. Of course, we've given him in-game currency, but also new gear for making videos, because he had a really horrible microphone when he started. Uh, with like He was filming with his own um, phone and trying to play with another, and, and that he had a really horrible microphone. And we just bought him a new one from Amazon and sent it to him. And the video quality was much better after that. And the fans were like, oh my god, thanks for tra thanks Traplight for, <laughs> for buying him a new, new gear, a uh, new microphone. So my tip is that keep your eyes uh, you know, peeled on your game and see if there's any influencers that are actually popping out from your game, because those are the most valuable for you as a company, to keep good relationship with them and, and kind of grow together. About the boring stuff, money and contracts, nobody wants to <laughs> think about this stuff, but it has to be thought, thought about. So campaign costs, um, this was also, uh, many of the questions uh, were about this. Before the, before the lecture. Um, so campaign costs can vary a lot. There is no, I cannot tell you any, any numbers, but they are between like $100 or less to hundreds of thousands of dollars. So it depends so much. There is no fixed price or anything. Um, the even same size or same performing uh, YouTubers can ask ve very, very different prices. So it's just uh, asking and, and, and um, getting to know them. And things that affect the price, there are things that affect it, so that's, that's good to know. Uh, whether you're making the deal through the MCN, or a freelance agent, or the platform that I talked about earlier, or you're directly contacting them. So all of these things can affect how much the campaign is actually going to cost. Of course, the subscriber count and the average views are going to affect the price. So the YouTubers are pretty good at estimating their own price tag these days. So they know that if they have lots of views, they are more valu valuable for you, of course. So uh, it goes up as the subscribers and views grow up generally, but there are lots of differences in between. And of course, market trends and norms affect this. So if the, if the influencers, for example, nowadays they know pretty well how much, uh, how much developers pay per user when they are um, making normal marketing campaigns. Like if they do user acquisition, the influencers know that, OK, an average app store or um, iOS user in the US costs more than $5 to get. 
to play your game. So they know that, so they, they can price themselves, and they also know that they have better performance. They're, the fans that come through their videos are better quality than from other marketing campaigns. So they know this pretty well, and they, they are very informed. And uh, usually the contracts that you do with them, if you have a contract, uh, they are usually like, you make X amount of videos, one is usual, just make one video and uh, you get paid either by acquisition, so uh, by each user that you get to the game through the video, or you get this X amount of money for that one video. There are also some more exotic deals that you can have. I've heard of, or I know that some companies have, for example, given company shares or revenue shares to the, to the influencers. Uh, but also, you can, for example, employ them. Just, you know, <laughs> get them to work for you. This is what Supercell has done. They have many in-house influencers that started off as normal influencers in YouTube, but they uh, started doing Supercell games, and now some of them are actually employed and working at Supercell. <clears throat> All right, we're getting closer to the end. What about after you've done a campaign? What happens then? Do you just like and go home or what happens? I'd say that it's not that, you, you do something else. You measure the results. Uh, of course, before you even start a campaign, you should have some sort of idea of what to expect. You understand your own game's performance. You know the normal numbers that you would get from players, their retention and how much they use money and stuff like that. But you, you need to know this to be able to compare how did the campaign perform. perform. So first of all, how many downloads for your game or purchases for your game, if you have a premium game, you got through this video. Uh, there are these paid campaigns, of course, when you have a tracking link, you have in the, in the uh, description of the video, you have, you know, it says download the game and there's the link and that link is tracked so you can tell how many people actually click through that and downloaded the game. But then there's also the, the organic users that don't use the link. Even if you paid for the video, they might just go to App Store or uh, Steam or whatever and search for the game. And uh, uh, then you don't really know uh, who they are. Uh, if you do an unpaid campaign and you didn't pay the influencer, you are most likely not going to have a tracking link, so you just have to rely on understanding the organic downloads. So if you see a spike, if you're not doing any other marketing at that point and you see a spike after the video is launched in the download amounts, you can, you can say that that portion is probably from the video because there was not, no other action going on. If you have lots of other things going on at the same time, then it's impossible to tell. This is interesting, very boring <laughs> for some, but for, for, for it's very important if you want to do this for a long time and in scale. Uh, cost per install. So you want to understand how much it actually costs you to acquire one player for your game. So you need to understand your game's lifetime, uh, the user's lifetime value, the average user's lifetime value. That means how much is, on average, one user going to bring you in the game? How much are they going to use money? Or if you have a premium game that doesn't have any extra downloads or anything, then the LTV is just the cost of your game. That's pretty easy. For free-to-play games, you have to understand what is the amount of money that you're expecting for one user to make you. And then you have the cost per install, which is you can calculate that after the after the campaign, how many downloads you got, how much did one user cost, and you need to compare these. If the lifetime value is bigger than the cost per install, then that's great. You can do more of this. You, you don't lose money by marketing your game. That's, that's a great thing. So you need to understand that if you want to do a lot of this. Uh, if you want to just make like a publicity thing and it's not so much about, you don't care that much about the downloads or anything, you just want to kind of boost your brand image or whatever, then this is not so important. And of course, the virality, you want to track this, see you know, how many views you got, was there any trickle down effect, did other influencers pick up the game, uh, was the video shared on some other platforms, uh, did some media cover this, this video that was made, and this is also more related to the brand recognition part. And also, read the viewer uh, comments and feedback. And there's these things because uh, th there's an example of our campaign and it went pretty well. I'm going to show 
more deeply in the next slide. So breakdown of our results. Uh, this is from the campaign that I've been talking about where we invited, uh, it, the part of this campaign was that we invited some of the YouTubers over to Finland and had the party and all that. So this is kind of the, the whole launch campaign that we did with Big Bang Rising. So uh, what actions we had, we had the party in Finland where we invited people uh, we created these custom hats for the in influencers and we of course gave them like the in-game currency and all that. And then uh, we also just sent emails to some YouTubers to ask them to try the game. And the, uh, the channels that finally made videos of our game, the subscriber amounts varied between 5.5 million and 13,000. Uh, there were others as well, but this is um, the most significant uh, channels that created videos, so these are the ones that I'm, I'm putting here. And uh, yeah, we got views on the videos that they made between 1.2 million and 12,000. And we estimated we got around 250,000 downloads to the game uh, based on the, on the influencer campaigns. We didn't have any tracking links, but we were able to uh, estimate the percentage of, of players that we're probably downloading the game because of the videos. And the, you can see there are some of the numbers, but for example, the cost per install was really low. Uh, in this budget, we, uh, we haven't calculated anything like work uh, salaries or uh, stuff like that, which of course we used a lot of our working time to make this happen and the graphic designers, uh, they made the hats and whatnot. So the, if you would count those, then the budget would be bigger. But for the actual money that we used, we got pretty good results and we're very happy with the, with the stuff that we got out of it. And finally, uh, what to do like after measuring the results. If it all worked well and you're, you, know, you got happy, happy viewers, they liked the game, the influencer was happy with the campaign, uh, you're, you didn't lose at least a lot of money, <laughs> then you know, do it again. That's a great job. Learn from it and just keep doing what you're doing and maybe improve. And if you had any problems, just really like look, look what went wrong and try to learn from them. Uh, if you had bad communication with the influencer or the fans didn't like it or your, your uh, cost per install was way too high for you to sustain this type of thing, Try to you know, dig down into the problems and understand what is going on. And then keep the YouTubers in loop. Uh, let them know of the results of your campaigns. Uh, they, they really want to know. They want to know how your game performed on their channel. And if it did well, they probably want to work with you again. And if it did not, they also want to know because that's good information for them that this type of game, for example, is probably not good for their channel. So they will appreciate the information. And remember to contact each and every one of those trickle-down uh, YouTubers. Uh, so keep looking at YouTube after uh, having one video published because it's, it's very likely that some other YouTubers are going to pick up your game, game anyway. So contact those and try to you know, thank, them, thank them for making a video and then send them some cool stuff and whatever to encourage them maybe making more videos. So. Thanks for the, this is the part where, that was what I had prepared. And now I have a couple of slides from pre-made questions. Uh, I think we have still time. So I'm gonna go through the questions that you guys send uh, pretty quickly. And then if you have any extra questions, I'm gonna be answering those. So first of all, Aaron, I don't know if Aaron is here, but he asked about uh, how usual it is to localize your campaigns, your influencer campaigns. And uh, the short answer is it is usual. And there are things that you need to take into account. So for example, your game language. If you're working with an influencer uh, in Russia or in Brazil, you really can't do it without having your game also translated to Russian or uh, Portuguese. So you need to understand who, who you're working with because their audience will want to see the game in their native language. And uh, that's also important for the influencer if their channel is in Portuguese or in Russian. So that's one part of the campaign localization. 
Then, if you're doing soft launch, uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the term, but basically it means that you test launch your game in a small region to see how the audience reacts, how the game performs, and you usually do this well before global launch uh, in a very targeted small audience. For example, like Italy would be a good example. I don't know how much it's used actually nowadays, but it's a, a defined area that has one language and the language is not spoken anywhere else in the world. So you know that it's kind of confined in that area if you do a soft launch there. And when you do the soft launch, uh, you want to think about the influencers in that area and um, uh, maybe localize stuff for them and just contact the right influencers. If you're doing soft launch, you don't want to work with an uh, English-speaking influencer necessarily because their audience is all around. And if your game is only available in Italy, you want the Italians to be able uh, to see the video and to download the game. And for Asian markets, they are their own beast entirely. Uh, if you want to do influencer marketing in Asia, in uh, uh, China, Japan, or Korea, you have to understand that their influencers scene is completely different from ours. Many of them, uh, they have, for example, YouTube, but China, they don't have YouTube at all. They have their completely own platforms. Uh, Korea has also very uh, defined other platforms. They use also YouTube and a bit of uh, Twitch, but they also have their own stuff. And they also have very uh, different um, expectations for games, so the influencers there might actually need very different things than the influencers in Western markets. And yeah, so short answer to Aron's question, it's very common to localize your influencer campaigns if you're doing any of these above mentioned things. Then, this was asked by a couple of people. Yasmina, Aneta, and Paulina asked about uh, can, the, you know, um, can they say whatever they want, the influencers, and how do the, the developers react if the influencers say bad things about your game? So. If the influencers are getting paid and there's a contract, written contract with them, usually that includes some sort of details about what they at least should say. Uh, it might not say anything about, like, don't say this. Some developers might go as far as, like, having a very detailed list of what they can say and what they cannot. But uh, usually they include something like, yeah, you have to, you know, show the game. You have to play the game <laughs> in, the, in the video. Those are the typical things that you request when you're making a contract. You might have more details. I personally don't like to strict, strict uh, um, these requests or, or things because usually that just uh, makes the videos very awkward. They, they have to follow a script that was not made by them and they know their audience, so it's better to let them to uh, create the, the fun content. Of course, uh, they should understand how the game works and all that, so they can figure out the, the funniest and best parts to show. But if you're not paying these influencers and they're just making videos of your game, you basically have nothing you can do. <laughs> you can just, you know, wow, they made a video and they hate my game, but, you know, all publicity is good, so yeah, don't, don't get discouraged. I mean, if you get an influencer make a video of your game and they say that it's the worst game ever, it probably is, and also it's also good for you because you're going to get sales through that video. So um, if your game is, is uh, if, if an influencer plays your game and hates it, it's so bad that it's worth showing. Uh, so they are not game journalists. They're not gonna, you know, review games that are like semi-okay, okay, like these m mediocre. They're not gonna play any of those. So either it's like really bad that it's so fun, or it's like a good game that they actually like. Uh, here's a good example. If anyone wants to go watch that video of 100 feet robot golf. It was a horrible game, and I watched the video, and it's hilarious. It's so buggy and so horrible, but it's a good example of a game that probably wouldn't have gotten so many sales if this guy hadn't made a video and gotten like 1.1 million views on it. So, <laughs> so I mean, it, it was a lottery win for these developers that they got the video. A uh, question by Yuri. Yuri asked, um, why haven't other developers uh, filed these um, takedowns on, on their 
the game content on PewDiePie's channel. After, if somebody is not aware, PewDiePie said a racial slur in a stream, and this caused the developers of Firewatch, uh, this game, to um, file a takedown on the, their um, game content on PewDiePie's channel. And it's a, it's a big thing going on. I don't know if it's still going on very much, but one reason why other uh, developers haven't gone and jumped the train is because they don't actually have any basis for the takedown. Um, that's, the, that's the truth. Uh, most games, they don't have any restrictions in their terms of service saying about you, sh you cannot make video content of our game. And um, they might even encourage making video content of your game, so, like uh, Firewatch developers have encouraged and they still have that in their terms of service or their frequently asked questions. Uh, if, if the racial slur didn't happen in your game video, it's really, you have no basis. Also, there's the fair use clause that uh, allows people to make these kind of journalist um, clips and videos of any content. And uh, for example, this uh, video that PewDiePie made of Firewatch, it did kind of fall into the uh, fair use category. So there's really no basis. The other reason is that because influencers are so valuable for developers, developers don't really want to scare them off. So if many developers suddenly started making these uh, claims and uh, take down, they wanted to uh, their, them, uh, like sue them or, or, or ask them to take down the, the videos, this would kind of scare the whole influencer or the YouTuber community, I, I feel, that uh, they would be very hesitant. To, like, can we, like, is this even good to make any video content if at any point a developer can come and start, you know, yelling at us? Um, and also one reality is that these developers continue to get lots of benefits for having their game represented on PewDiePie's channel. So that's one reason. But it's, I think it's good that this situation came up and it has brought up many of these moral issues with working with influencers and, and this whole genre in, in general. But to be kind of realistic, there isn't really much basis for it for these takedowns at the moment. One more question. This is the last one that I have on the slides uh, by Tuure. Uh, they asked if, like, if there are some games that benefit more from, from influencer videos or, or having their games played on Twitch or YouTube, and if there are some games that don't benefit so much. And there is. So, Games that benefit most, most from having the games played on YouTube or Twitch are online multiplayers, just because they have infinite uh, replay value, every match is different, so it's always fresh and fun stuff for the, for the uh, viewers to, to see. Uh, also, free-to-play mobile games have kind of the similar thing. They are virtually endless. Of course, they have some sort of cap when you start progressing so much. But usually they, they just keep going and going. They're not so um, linear, linear in, a, that, in that sense. So you can just keep showing those games uh, and keep, it, keep the content fresh. And then these kind of small addictive games that might, other, might not otherwise make enough money to actually market themselves, but they just become super viral overnight. Like, for example, these um, um, dot .io games, like all of these kind of snake uh, copy games that have become very popular, they, they probably wouldn't make enough money per user to actually start doing proper marketing, but they get lots of benefits for, from YouTubers or Twitchers picking up the game for 10 minutes and just having fun with it. Games that don't benefit so much, uh, the biggest group is the story-driven story linear games. Good example being, uh, for example, Quantum Break. It's quite short. It's very linear. It has a very heavy story element in it. So if a YouTuber shows that game uh, on, on their channel, they have a playthrough, for example, then it's a good question for the developer to think that if they already saw how the game is going to end, they know all the twists, are they really going to download it? There is no like proof that it's going to be any hindrance, but it, it would seem that it's not so beneficial. Um, well, I mean, Remedy was very fortunate to get PewDiePie uh, without asking to play the whole game through, but it's a good question. Like, did it, how many of those people who watched the playthrough uh, downloaded the game after that? Of course, it's good publicity, publicity anyway. 
And then uh, already mentioned earlier, these super casual games like Candy Crush or these one button, button clickers, they're probably not the best games to put on YouTube or Twitch, maybe on other, other social media platforms. And then you can have like these small indie, indie games or arty games that get uh, some, some visibility through influencers picking, it, picking them up, but usually they don't kind of spread around and they don't get that much of a virality effect because they are so niche, for example. So, that was my thing. Thank you. And if you have any more questions, please ask. So much light. All right. Do we have sound? Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Vera, for the lecture. Uh, let's see if we have some questions from the audience. Uh, anybody, anything that you want to know from Vera? She's here now to answer whatever was kind of on your mind during you listening. I don't know if I went through it so fast that nobody Actually, nothing stuck in your brain, but... I think that there was a lot of answers already in the lecture. Uh, I have questions. All right. And then there's, there was also questions on the stream. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, I'm actually pretty interested in how did you, how did you start doing this kind of back, background research of YouTubers? Did you, did you do kind of... Were you active on YouTube before you started doing this for Traplight? Um, no, no, I wasn't. Uh, it actually started just because we we make user-generated content games, and we figured that the creation part, like making making levels and using the editor, that would be fun uh, content for YouTube and and streams, and that was the kind of the basis of it. Uh, we thought that yeah, it's we think it's fun to show to others, and it's fun to watch other people create levels. So that was the basis of, OK, we need to know everything about YouTubers and start researching. What can we do with them? How do they work? What is this thing? You know, that, that how it, That's how it started. But eventually, actually, we ended up not doing so much of the user-generated content or the, the editor part, like showing the drawing and stuff. There are some, some smaller YouTubers that are really into that subgenre of showing like speed painting levels and, and teaching others how to make cool levels, but that wasn't something that we put, like eventually we didn't put like lots of effort with the big influencers on that. Because it requires so much skill, like not all the influencers were you know, great with the editor. It requir requires a certain type of person that you just dive into the level editor for, you know, two weeks and come up with something amazing. So not, not two weeks. You can make cool level in five hours, but yeah. You, you were showing us that you created a list of uh, uh, influencers. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, like, how you, you probably use quite a lot of time to go through the videos. Yes, uh, yes, it takes time. Um, that's why the... The first option that was the do-it-yourself style uh, when contacting or, or trying to contact influencers, it, it's, it's good for, for if you have more time than money, then that's a very good option <laughs> to do because that was uh, our situation. So I had to kind of figure out how to, how can we make them interested without being like a big developer already and having a huge marketing budget and all that. So, but it, I think it's good stuff to do even if you're even if you're a big developer just to kind of understand the whole scene better but yeah it takes time yeah okay i also um i wanted to know whether um oh just for a second uh okay i lost my thought um but yeah okay yeah how do you keep up with this you've been doing this research for for your company for past two to three years, mm -hmm. and probably also already things have changed, but there's things that are about to change too. So how do you keep up with all of this? Well, um, mostly it comes through the games that we're developing. So we try to think from our point of view, like what would be the next step for us, and not just uh, 
keep, you know, we found some pretty good things with Big Bang Rising, but we don't want to settle with that. So we want to keep trying to find some new stuff. So I guess that's, that's how you do it. And just, you know, watching YouTube, watching streams, uh, keeping up with what are the influencers doing at the moment? What are the big new things? Like if you see a new game pop up everywhere on YouTube, you should definitely look into that if you, if you want to understand how the scene works. Like, dive into that game and understand why why is this game now suddenly played everywhere is it just because it's popular anyway or is there something else like brewing underneath did they do something very well to attract all these influencers is there any conferences or any kind of where where can you get the better understanding of of the use of influencers uh, well nowadays like within like in the past year or so, uh, most game conferences have started including influencer tracks on their on their schedule. So most game events nowadays have uh, influencer tracks. You will have panels with influencers and developers talking about how they do these campaigns, how influencers work, and all that. So definitely going to game events is good. It's very good. And talking to other developers who you know have made campaigns. Yes. Is there any question? I have more, but okay, there, there is a question from Mika. I'm so close to Mika so that I will just give this microphone. Thanks. Uh, I was thinking, um, is this like the only thing you're doing at, at the company? And also then is it like easy uh, to push this kind of perspective on, for example, game design and which features to implement? Because we all know there's always too little time and, and so many things to tweak and stuff. Yeah. And then when this kind of new uh, point of view again comes with more more things to take into account and one more thing to optimize, how, how do the people in the team feel about it? Uh, yeah, um, well, what was the first part of the question? That's do you only do this? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, do, I do like community stuff, so I, I, I'm at the forums and just think about the players in general, uh, like, talk with them, try to figure out uh, stuff that is good for them. And we have quite, a, we have three people working on community. So uh, like they're doing other things as well, but there's like three people who actively participate in discussions and read player feedback and all that. So I, that's one part. And then uh, just the marketing part, like uh, even like these uh, traditional user acquisition campaigns where you just make an ad, put it on Facebook or, or YouTube to roll there, and then you look at the stats and what's going on. I do some of that, and then like design, marketing stuff in general. Then there's the influencer part, which is pretty big. Uh, and to incorporate that in our design, I think that was a very easy decision for, for all of us, because we saw how well it worked with Big Bang Rising. So the, everyone in our teams know that it, they are important people, and as we especially want to take them into account in our, our game. So I don't think it, it, feel, it doesn't feel like I have to push something on the teams and, and the designers, or I just make them feel like, oh, there's one more thing to add. But they, they already think about these things in the pre-production. So, when you think about these things early on, it doesn't feel like you're adding forcefully something, but you have already kind of thought about a nice package that is the minimum viable for also these things. So I think it has worked very well in our, in our team. And um, was there some other part? No. I think yes. that's it. Thank you. Also, maybe some background information of Traplight. Uh, so how big is the company and uh, is there more than one design team? Uh, yes, so um, Traplight was uh, established in 2010. Uh, we did some um, by, by three people, Jari Paananen, Sami Kalliakoski and Riku Rakkola. And they, they, at first they did some like um, uh, work for hire for, for example Supercell and Red Links and some other big companies. And then at some point they, they decided to start doing their own games and this user-generated content part came in and we got uh, money to start developing these games and now we're 25 people and we published Big Bang Raising uh, in the summer of 2016 so about year and four five months ago and uh, now we have three game teams working on uh, we have one live game and we have uh, well actually we have several uh, new games uh, like new lines so there are several teams from like about five people in one team. 
Nice. Uh, I have a, a long question mm -hmm. from the Shoot stream. It. This is from a fellow influencer person uh -huh. uh, from Massive, okay. a very different kind of a game company. But he's, he's saying, so Alessandro is saying that uh, problems with traditional, traditional uh, YouTube and Twitch influencers is first, require effort in terms of maintenance and coaching to represent a liability for negative press, what we already d discussed here for the PewDiePie. Uh, and three, are more interested in establishing their own brand. So what do you think about that? Uh, isn't it time to look for less glamorous, more grassrooty influencers emerging from the community of players actually engaged with the game? Uh, well, short an answer is definitely yes, and that's why I, I bring always up these micro and nano influencers in my when I'm talking about this because for us uh, they are like considered as uh, if not even like more important than the the big influencers because there's uh, as said they have more engaged fans and they're more kind of authentic. They are actually weirdly enough sometimes easier to work with than the big influencers uh, for the aforementioned reason, reasons because sometimes there can be these ego issues at some point not all of them like there are very very uh, lovely people also in the big influencer category of course and there are some uh, not so lovely people in the in the smaller but i think that that yes so the small influencers you should not overlook them and uh, find ways to work with them the problem is that they are harder to reach as i said like they they, they are elusive and they are not part of any networks. They might not even have an email address on their channel. So it's very frustrating when you are like, how do I contact these people? But there are ways. So you can try to design, for example, like if you design these games for them, then they will find their way and then you might have some ways to kind of get them to your little circle of, of um, trust and love <laughs> with your game company. So yeah. Uh, you I also you also talked about in the lecture that in your game there is um, there's a way to follow other creators mm -hmm. of the levels and so on and so forth. So those are like uh, what would you call them like internal influencers? Yeah, yeah, they're they we consider them more like uh, internal influencers. So um, some games have like these social whales that they consider as internal influencers. They can be, for example, guild leaders. They probably don't make any content outside, but they're very influential influential inside the game. So we have, the, because we make user-generated content games, we have this special category of internal influencers that are the creators, the top creators that create amazing content and they already have a fan base inside the game. So uh, that's, that's one group that we're definitely like keeping our eyes on. Yeah. Any questions from the audience? Lassie, you had some? Yeah, one, which is, uh, does this work? Yeah, so if you have an absolute shoestring budget, can you still work with like influencers and what would you do? Yes, you can, okay. even with no, no money. It's going to be hard. It's going to take a lot of your time and effort into finding the right people who genuinely get excited about your game and some other things that you can offer them. There are things that you can offer that are not money. As I said in the lecture, um, you, if you design your game so that you can tell them from the get-go that if you play this game, you can do this really cool thing where you invite, the, invite your fans to you know, do this thing with you inside the game and then you can give them this as a gift and whatnot. There are all these things that will make the influencer feel like, yes, this would suit my channel and my fans would love it even though I'm not getting paid. So it's definitely possible and, and we've also managed to get very nice uh, uh, contacts with influencers and, and uh, very valuable feedback and all that, you know, without paying. And of course, it's, it's, uh, many of them will want to get paid, but if you do a lot of work and you use your time instead of money, then you, you will get results as well. And then, of course, try to look for the, the micro-influencer category instead of trying to reach PewDiePie if you don't have any budget, so. Okay, thanks. Uh, I think I have a one final question for you, Vera. Um, so, kind of bridging towards the lecture that we're going to have in two weeks about uh, bridging the cultural gaps b gap between the East and the West. Mm -hmm. So, how much have you actually tried to kind of look at how how could you reach, for instance, the Chinese uh, audience through the influencers? 
Um, well, I have done some research. Uh, it's, it's, as I said, it's its own beast, the whole Asian market, and, and the sub markets inside are vastly different from each other as well. So you really have to dive in. <clears throat> I did some research on Korean influencers and they have really, really different things that they love. And uh, like we were, we were thinking of doing some, some campaigns with Korean influencers, but that got postponed almost indefinitely. I don't know, maybe it will happen in the future. And at least I've done the research beforehand. But for example, they have this weird subculture of, of eating videos. So that's the one thing just to keep in mind, like understand, Koreans love to watch other people eat. And that was like just a weird thing that I found out when doing the research. And many of the game influencers also eat on their channels. So maybe figure out a way to combine those two. Can you make a game that they can play while they're eating? Or I don't know, they're just these little things, quirks that you can find when you research. And just like the normal stuff, like platforms. They usually have a YouTube channel or Twitch channel, but they also do content on the native channels, uh, the uh, Korean channels that they have, and they usually put the video on both. And they have also these weird things that they might have really, really low subscriber count, but they get millions of views. So there are things that just don't match with the Western market. And it's the only way to understand is to well, of course, it's always good to have someone uh, uh, from that country that understands the culture and ask them, uh, how do you view videos? How do the influencers make videos? And what is the content usually about? Um, because it's also in another language, so you might not understand at all if you just try to look yourself. OK, thank you. I think that that was all the questions, unless there is something else here. So we should give a big uh, applause to to Vera. Thank you. Uh, and now it would be time for coffee. Uh, in two weeks, we will be on another location at the Startup Sauna. So we're going to see that also in stream, a little bit different environment. And in a few minutes, we're going to have a chat show with the students to talk about what Vera here was uh, lecturing for us. So thanks for joining the lecture here and also the streams. And see you in two weeks.